What's better than Anchor's podcast creation tools? Nothing. Mankind has always searched for evidence of God's perfection, and we found it. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use straight from your phone or computer. The creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. They'll distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and uh, the lesser of the podcast platforms, Stitcher. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I've made $5, and I've been doing this for three months. So, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Guys, what's going on with me? Nothing. Uh, and I still haven't picked out the next book I'm going to read. So you're getting more of the metamorphosis, kind of dragged out. And then after that, uh, maybe another little short story, and then hopefully I'll have made up my mind by then. So let's get into the show. Also, there may or may not be inappropriate content for kids or really sensitive adults. It's public domain books for the most part that I'm reading, so um, I think it's probably pretty safe and you should probably shouldn't worry about it. But I don't read any of this stuff before I start doing the podcast, so I'm kind of learning about the book as you do. And uh, if anything really cool happens that's sexual in nature or involves a lot of swearing, I'm going to be pretty impressed, just like you and maybe your kid in the back seat. And with that, enjoy this episode of Leaves of Glen. I am Glenn Nuzzles. So where did we leave off in the first chapter of this book? It was with Gregor waking up in the morning, feeling himself like a bug. His back is a big, huge shell, and he laid in bed with his tiny little legs wavering up at the ceiling. And he apparently didn't think much of it. He was more concerned about getting on the train and getting to work on time. A couple of annoying things for him. Not that the story's bad, but just for him. Uh, His family apparently got into some kind of debt and uh, were depending on Gregor to work at the company they owed the debt to to pay off the debt. So a bunch of lazy people sitting around this apartment he pays for, basically yelling at him to wake up and get on the train and get to work. Instead of them, you know, getting jobs and helping pay off whatever they owe to this company. Uh, So it's all up to him. And Gregor's such a nice guy, he doesn't take it personally or hold resentments. So all he cares about is getting up and getting on that train. He's a salesperson for the company. He's got to make sure he does well, even though they make it clear he's kind of average. He doesn't do the best. So... uh, He has a tough time getting out of bed because he's a giant bug. Doesn't take it too seriously, just keeps worrying and uh, trying to answer back to everyone that's knocking on the door. He's got a voice that sounds like a high-pitched squeal that no one can really understand. And he spends the majority of Chapter 1 trying to get the door unlocked to his bedroom. The company sends around a man to see why he's not at work yet, even though he just hasn't gotten to the train Uh, he would need time to ride the train to get into work. So apparently they're able to get to him faster than he's able to get to work and find out why he's not there yet. So it's almost like uh, uh, Philip K. Dick's precogs. They just psychically know he's late before he even has a chance to be late. So they show up and he spends the whole time trying to tell him that uh, I'm doing fine. I'll be into work. I'm just running a little late. But all all they hear is high-pitched squealing. And he finally gets the door unlocked, which freaks out the guy from work, and he runs off. Uh, The family is freaking out, and they try to shoo him back into his bedroom. And uh, he winds up getting a big cut because he's so wide that uh, they have to kind of tilt him sideways and slide him through the door. And then he uh, that was pretty much it. He just sort of passed out for a while. And that's where we left off in The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. He's created a hellscape where no one appreciates him, his work, or his family. He's just a donkey to keep working. This poor guy. No sympathy as he turns into a bug. Here's chapter two. Gregor first woke up from his heavy swoon-like sweep in the sleep in the evening twilight. 
He would certainly have woken up soon afterwards without any disturbance, for he felt himself sufficiently rested and wide awake, though it appeared to him as if a hurried step and a cautious closing of the door to the hall had aroused him. Light from the electric street lamps lay pale here and there on the ceiling and on the higher parts of the furniture, but underneath, around Gregor, it was dark. He pushed himself slowly toward the door, still groping awkwardly with his feelers, which he now learned to value for the first time, to check what was happening there. His left side seemed one single, long, unpleasant stretch scar, and he really had to hobble on his two rows of legs. In addition, one small leg had been seriously wounded in the course of the morning incident. It was almost a miracle that only one had been hurt and dragged lifelessly behind. By the door, he first noticed what had really lured him there. It was the smell of something to eat. A bowl stood there, filled with sweetened milk, in which swam tiny pieces of white bread, which is gross. Uh, he had almost laughed with joy, for he now had a much greater hunger than in the morning and he immediately dipped his head almost up to and over his eyes down into the milk, but he soon drew it back again in disappointment. Not just because it was difficult for him to eat, on account of his delicate left side, he could eat only if his entire panting body worked in coordinated way, but it also because the milk, which otherwise was his favorite drink, and which his sister had certainly placed there for that reason, did not appeal to him at all. He turned away from the bowl, almost with aversion, and crept back into the middle of the room. In the living room, as Gregor saw through the crack in the door, the gas was lit. But where, on other occasions at this time of day, his father was accustomed to read the afternoon newspaper in a loud voice to his mother and sometimes also to his sister, at the moment no sound was audible. Now, perhaps, this reading aloud, which... His sister had always spoken and written to him, had recently fallen out of their general routine. But it was still so still all around, in spite of the fact that the apartment was certainly not empty. What a quiet life a family leads, said Gregor to himself, and as he stared fixedly out in front of him into the darkness, he felt a great pride that he had been able to provide such a life in a beautiful apartment like this for his parents and his sister. But how would things go if now all tranquility, all prosperity, all contentment should come to a horrible end? In order not to lose himself in such thoughts, Gregor preferred to set himself moving, so he moved up and down in his room. Once, during the long evening, one side door and then the other door was open, just a tiny crack, and quickly closed again. Someone presumably needed to come in, but had then thought better of it. Gregor immediately took up a position by the living room door, determined to bring in the hesitant visitor, somehow or other, or at least to find out who it might be. But now the door was not opened anymore, and Gregor waited in vain. Earlier, when the door had been barred, they had all wanted to come in to him. Now, when he had opened one door, and when the others had obviously been opened during the day, no one came in anymore, and the keys were stuck in the locks on the outside. The light in the living room was turned off, only late at night, and now it was easy to establish that his parents and sister had stayed awake all this time. For one could hear clearly as all three moved away on tiptoe. Now it was certain that no one would come into Gregor anymore until the morning. Thus, he had a long time to think undisturbed about how he should recognize or reorganize his life from scratch. But the high open room in which he was compelled to lie flat on the floor, made him anxious. Without his being able to figure out the reason, for he had lived in the room for five years, with a half-unconscious turn and not without a slight shame, he scurried under the couch, where, in spite of the fact that his back was a little cramped, he could no longer lift up his head. He felt very comfortable and was sorry only that his body was too wide to fit completely under it. There he remained the entire night, which he spent partly in a state of semi-sleep, out of which his hunger constantly woke him with a start, but partly in a state of worry and murky hopes, which all led to the conclusion that 
For the time being, he would have to keep calm, and with patience and the greatest consideration for his family to tolerate the troubles which, in his prison condition, he was now forced to cause them. Already early in the morning, it was still almost night, Gregor had an opportunity to test the power of the decisions he had just made, for his sister, almost fully dressed, opened the door from the hall into his room and looked eagerly inside. She did not find him immediately, but when she noticed him under the couch, God, he had to be somewhere or other, for he could hardly fly away, she got such a shock that, without being able to control herself, she slammed the door and shut once again from the outside. However, as if she was sorry for her behavior, she immediately opened the door again and walked in on her tiptoes, as if she was in the presence of a serious invalid or a total stranger. Gregor had pushed his head forward, just to the edge of the couch, and was observing her. Would she really notice that he had left the milk standing? Not indeed, from any lack of hunger. And would she bring in something else to eat, more suitable to him? If she did not do it on her own, he would sooner starve to death than call her attention to the fact. Although he had a really powerful urge to move beyond the couch, to throw himself at his sister's feet, to beg her for something or other good to eat, but his sister noticed right away with the astonishment that the bowl was still full, and with only a little milk spilled around it. She picked it up immediately, though not with her bare hands, but with a rag, and took it out of the room. Gregor was extremely curious what she would bring as a substitute, and he pictured to himself different ideas about it, but he never could have guessed what his sister, out of the goodness of her heart, it in fact did. And this has been highlighted by 14 people here on my Kindle. She brought him, to test his taste, an entire selection, all spread out in an old newspaper. There were half-rotten vegetables and bones from the evening meal covered with a white sauce, which had almost solidified some raisins and almonds, cheese, which Gregor had declared inedible two days earlier, a slice of dry bread and a slice of salted bread smeared with butter. In addition to all this, she put down a bowl, probably designated once and for all as Gregor's, into which she had poured some water. And out of her delicacy of feeling, since she knew that Gregor would not eat in front of her, she went away very quickly, and even turned the key in the lock so that Gregor would now observe that he could make himself as comfortable as he wished. Gregor's small limbs buzzed now, at the time for eating had come. Uh, it just scooched me a bunch of pages. That's really annoying. We're almost there. Okay, the time for eating had come. His wounds must, in any case, have already healed completely. He felt no handicap on that score. He was astonished that, at that and thought about how uh, more than a month ago he had cut his finger slightly with a knife and how his wound had hurt, even though the day before yesterday. I am now going to be less sensitive, he thought, already sucking greedily on the cheese which had strongly attracted to him right away, more than all the other foods, quickly, and with his eyes watering with satisfaction, he ate one after the other, the cheese, the vegetables, and the sauce. The fresh food, by contrast, didn't taste good to him. He couldn't bear the smell or even carry the things he wanted to eat a little distance away. By the time his sister slowly turned the key as a sign that, she should, that he should withdraw, he was long finished and now lay lazily in the same spot. The noise immediately startled him, in spite of the fact that he was already almost asleep, and he scurried back again under the couch. But it cost him great self-control to remain under the couch, even for the short time his sister was in the room because his body had filled out somewhat on the account of the rich meal, and in a narrow space where he could scarcely breathe, in the midst of minor attacks of asphyxiation, he looked at her with somewhat protruding eyes as his unsuspecting sister swept up the broom, not just the remnants, but even the foods which Gregor had not touched at all, as if these were all also now useless. And as she dumped everything quickly into a bucket, which she closed with a wooden lid, and then carried all of it out of the room, 
She had hardly turned around before Gregor had already dragged himself out from the couch, stretched out, and let his body expand. In this way, Gregor got his food every day. Once in the morning, when his parents and the servant girl were still asleep, and a second time after their common noon meal, for his parents were, as before, asleep for a little while. And the servant girl was sent off by his sister on some errand or another. They certainly would not have wanted Gregor to starve to death, but perhaps they could not have endured finding out what he ate other than by hearsay. Perhaps his sister wanted to spare them what was possibly only a small grief, for they were really suffering quite enough already. What sorts of excuses people had used on that first morning to get the doctor and the locksmith out of the house, Gregor was completely unable to ascertain. Since they could not understand him, no one, not even his sister, thought that he might be able to understand others. And thus, when his sister was in her room, he had to be content with listening now and then to her sighs and invocations to the saints. Only later, when she had grown somewhat accustomed to everything, naturally, there could never be any talk of her growing completely accustomed to it, Gregor sometimes caught a comment, which was intended uh, to be friendly or could be interpreted as such, Well, today it tasted good to him, she said, if Gregor had really cleaned up what he had to eat, whereas in reverse situation, which gradually repeated itself more and more frequently, uh, she used to say, now everything has uh, stopped again. But while Gregor could get no new information directly, he did hear a good deal from the room next door. And as soon as he heard voices, he scurried right away to the appropriate door and pressed his entire body against it. In the early days, especially, there was no conversation which was not concerned with in some way or another, even if only in secret. For two days at all meal times, discussions on that subject could be heard on how people should now behave. But they also talked about the same subject in the times between meals. For there were always at least two family members at home, since no one really wanted to remain in the house alone and people could not, under any circumstances, leave the apartment completely empty. In addition, on the very first day, the servant girl, it was not completely clear what and how much she knew about what had happened, on her knees had begged his mother to let her go immediately. And when she said goodbye about 15 minutes later, she thanked them for the dismissal with tears in her eyes as if she was receiving the greatest favor for which people had shown her there. And without anyone demanding it from her, she swore a fearful oath not to betray anyone, not even the slightest bit. Now his sister had to team up with his mother to do the cooking, although that didn't create much trouble because people were eating almost nothing. Again and again, Gregor listened as one of them vainly invited another one to eat and received no answer other than, thank you, I've had enough, or something like that. And perhaps they had stopped having anything to drink, too. His sister often asked his father whether he wanted to have a beer and gladly offered to fetch it herself. And when his father was silent, she said, in order to remove any reservation he might have, that she could send the caretaker's wife to get it. But then his father finally said a resounding no, and nothing more could be spoken about it. Already during the first day, his father laid out all the financial circumstances and prospects to his mother and his sister as well. From time to time, he stood up from the table and pulled out of the small lockbox, salvaged from his business, which had collapsed five years previously, some document or other or some notebook. The sound was audible as he opened up the complicated lock and after removing what he was looking for, locked it up again. These explanations by his father were, in part, the first enjoyable thing that Gregor had had the chance to listen to since his imprisonment. He had thought that nothing at all was left over for his father from that business. At least his father had told him nothing to contradict that view, and Gregor, in any case, hadn't asked him about it. At the time, Gregor's only concern had been to use everything he had in order to allow his family to forget as quickly as possible the business misfortune 
uh, which had been brought to uh, them all into the state of complete hopelessness. And so at that point, he started to work with a special intensity, and from an assistant had become almost overnight a traveling salesman who naturally had entirely different possibilities for earning money and whose successes at work were converted immediately into the form of cash commissions, which could be set out on the table at home in front of an astonished and delighted family. Those had been beautiful days, and they had never come back afterwards, at least not with the same splendor, in spite of the fact that Gregor later earned so much money that he was in a position to bear the expenses of the entire family, costs which he, in fact, did bear. They had become quite accustomed to it, both the family and Gregor as well. They took the money with thanks, and he happily surrendered it. But the special warmth was no longer present. Only the sister had remained still close to Gregor, and it was his secret plan to send her next year to the conservatory, regardless of the great expense which that necessarily involved and which would be made up in other ways. In contrast to Gregor, she loved music very much and knew how to play the violin charmingly. Now and then, during Gregor's short stays in the city, the conservatory was mentioned in conversations with his sister, but always only as a beautiful dream, whose realization was unimaginable. And their parents never listened to these innocent expectations with pleasure, but Gregor thought about them with scrupulous consideration and intended to explain the matter ceremoniously on Christmas Eve. In his present situation, such uh, feudal ideas went through his head while he pushed himself right up against the door and listened. Sometimes, in his general exhaustion, he couldn't listen any more and let his head bang listlessly against the door. But he immediately pulled himself together, for even the small sound which he made by this mention, motion, was heard near and by and silenced everyone. There he goes again, said his father after a while, clearly turning toward the door. And only then would the interrupted conversation gradually be resumed again. <clears throat> Gregor found out clearly enough for his father tended to repeat himself often in his explanations, partly because he had not personally concerned himself with these matters for a long time now, and partly because his mother did not understand everything right away the first time. That, in spite of all bad luck, a fortune, although a very small one, was available from the old times, which the interest, which had not been touched, had in the intervening time gradually allowed to increase a little. Furthermore, in addition to this, the money which Gregor had brought home every month had kept only a few florins for himself, had not been completely spent, and had grown into a small capital amount. Gregor behind the door nodded eagerly, rejoicing over his unanticipated foresight and frugality. True! With this excess money, uh, he could have paid off more of his father's debt to the employer, and the day on which he could be rid of this position would have been a lot closer. But now things were doubtless better the way his father had arranged them. At the moment, however, this money was not nearly sufficient to permit the family to live on the interest payments. Perhaps it would be enough to maintain the family for one or at most two years, that's all. Thus, it only added up to an amount which one should not really draw upon and which must be set aside for an emergency. But the money to live on had to be earned. Now, although his father was old, he was a healthy man who had not worked at all for five years and thus could not be counted on for very much. He had in these five years the first holidays of his trouble-filled but unsuccessful life put on a good deal of fat and thus become uh, really heavy. And should his old mother now perhaps work for money, a woman who suffered from asthma, for whom wandering through the apartment even now was a great strain, and who spent every second day on the sofa by the open window laboring for breath, should his sister earn money, a girl who was still 17 year old, a child who, whose earlier lifestyle had been so very delightful that it had consisted of dressing herself nicely, sleeping in late and helping around the house, taking part in a few modest enjoyments, and above all, 
playing the violin? Nine people highlighted this part. When it came to talking about this need to earn money, at first Gregor went away from the door and threw himself on the cool leather sofa beside the door, for he was quite hot from shame and sorrow. Often he lay there all night long. He didn't sleep a moment and just scratched on the leather for hours at a time. He undertook the very difficult task of shoving a chair over to the window, then he crept up on the window sill and, braced in the chair, leaned against the window to look out. Obviously, with some memory or other of the satisfaction, uh, which that used to bring him in earlier times, actually, from day to day, he perceived things with less and less clarity. Even those a short distance away, the hospital across the street, uh, the all-too-frequent sight of which he had previously cursed, was not visible at all anymore. And if he had not been precisely aware that he lived in the quiet but completely urban Charlotte Street, he could have believed that from his window he was uh, peering out at a featureless wasteland in which the gray heaven and the gray earth had merged and were indistinguishable. His attentive sister must have observed a couple of these, uh, that the chair stood by the window, then, after cleaning up in the room each time, she pushed the chair back right against the window, from, and from now on she even left the inner casement open. If Gregor had only been able to speak to his sister and thank her for everything that she had to do for him, she, uh, he would have tolerated her service more easily. As it was, he suffered under it. The sister admittedly sought to cover up the awkwardness of everything as much as possible, and as time went by, she naturally got more successful at it. But with the passing of time, Gregor also came to understand everything more precisely. Even her entrance was terrible for him. As soon as she entered, she ran straight to the window without taking the time to shut the door, in spite of the fact that she was otherwise very considerate in the sparing anyone of the sight of Gregor's room, and yanked the window open with eager hands, as if she was almost suffocating, and remained for a while by the window, breathing deeply, even when it was still too cold. With this running and noise, she frightened Gregor twice a day. The entire time he trembled under the couch, and yet he knew very well that she would have certainly spared him gladly if it had only been possible to remain with the window closed in a room where Gregor lived. On one occasion, about once a month, had already gone by since uh, Gregor's transformation, and there was now no particular reason any more for his sister to be startled at Gregor's appearance. She arrived a little earlier than usual and came upon Gregor as he was still looking out the window, immobile and well-positioned to frighten someone. It would not have come as a surprise to Gregor if she had not come in, since his position was preventing her from opening the window immediately. But... She not only did not step inside, she even retreated, shut the door. A stranger might really have concluded from this that Gregor had been lying in wait for her and wanted to bite her. Of course, Gregor immediately concealed himself under the couch, but he had to wait until the noon meal before his sister returned, and she seemed much less calm than usual. From this, he realized that his appearance was still consistently intolerable to her and must remain intolerable in future, and that she really had to exert a lot of self-control not to run away from a glimpse of only the small part of his body which stuck out from under the couch. In order to spare her even this sight, one day he dragged the sheet on his back and onto the couch. This task uh, took him four hours and arranged it in such a way that he was now completely concealed and his sister, even if she bent down, would not see him. If this sheet was not necessary as far as she was concerned, then she could remove it, for it was clear enough that Gregor uh, could not derive any pleasure from isolating himself away so completely. But she left the sheet just as it was, and Gregor believed he even caught a look of gratitude when, on one occasion, he carefully lifted up the sheet a little, with his head to check, as his sister took stock of the new arrangement. In the first two weeks... His parents could not bring themselves to visit him, and he often heard how they fully acknowledged his sister's present work, whereas earlier they had often got annoyed at his sister because she seemed to them somewhat of a useless young woman. However, now both his father and his mother often waited in front of Gregor's door while his sister cleaned up inside, 
Then as soon as she came out, she had to explain in detail how things looked in the room. What Gregor had eaten, how he had behaved this time, and whether perhaps a slight improvement was perceptible. In any event, his mother completely soon wanted to visit Gregor, or comparatively soon wanted to visit Gregor. But his father and his sister restrained her. At first, with reasons which Gregor listened to very attentively, and which he completely endorsed. Later, however, they had told her, or they had to hold her back forcefully. And when she then cried, Let me go to Gregor. He is my unlucky son. Don't you understand that I have to go to him? Gregor then thought that perhaps it would be a good thing if his mother had come in. Not every day, of course, but maybe once a week. She understood everything much better than his sister, who, in spite of all her courage, was still a child and, in last analysis, had perhaps undertaken such a difficult task only out of a childish recklessness. Okay, well, let's take a little break. And we'll read about an exciting new book from Penguin Random House. Uh, this one, coming out July 30th, A Song of Ice and Fire 2020 Calendar. Uh, illustrations by John Howe, uh, by George R. Martin. You want to learn about this calendar that's coming out soon from Penguin Random House? Uh... The magical creatures of A Game of Thrones and beyond come to life in a 2020 calendar inspired by George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire, featuring illustrations by acclaimed artist John Howe. Fantastic beasts are not solely for the purview of Newt Scamander. I'll never be able to say that name. With such creatures also abound in George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire novels, one of the most successful and beloved fantasy series ever written. And who better to bring these creatures to life than acclaimed artist John Howe, who has built a huge reputation for his stunning work in Middle Earth. <laughs> Here are the Sphinxes and uh, the Krakens, Sea Dragons and Ice Spiders, a thrilling pena pena penelope, penopoly of creatures both real and legendary, and some a bit of both. Now in its 10th year, this annual calendar is a timely addition to a franchise that has continued to grow with each passing year. 12 stunning paintings, including a bonus fold-out poster. So there you go. Make sure to go out and pick up a Song of Ice and Fire 2020 calendar uh, from George R. R. Martin. And back to the story. Gregor's wish to see his mother was soon realized. Well, during the day, Gregor, out of consideration for his parents, did not want to show himself by the window. He couldn't crawl around very much on the few square meters of his floor. He found it difficult to bear lying quietly during the night, and soon eating no longer gave him the slightest pleasure. So, for diversion, he acquired the habit of crawling back and forth across the walls and ceiling. He was especially fond of hanging from the ceiling. The experience was quite different from lying on the floor. It was uh, easier to breathe. A slight vibration went through his body, and in the midst of the almost happy amusement which Gregor found up there, it could happen that, uh, to his own surprise, he let go and hit the floor. However, he naturally controlled his body quite differently and did not injure himself in such a great fall. His sister noticed immediately the new amusement which Gregor had found for himself. For as he crept around, uh, he left behind here and there traces of his sticky stuff. And so he got the idea of making... Uh, she got the idea of making Gregor's creeping around as easy as possible and thus of removing the furniture which got in the way, especially the chest of drawers and the writing desk. But she was in no position to do this by herself. She did not dare to ask her father for help, and the servant girl would certainly have not assisted her. For although this girl, about 16 years old, had courageously remained since the dismissal of the previous cook, she had begged for the privilege of being allowed to stay permanently confined to the kitchen, and of having to open the door only in answer to special summons. Thus, his sister had no other choice but to involve his mother while his father was absent. His mother approached Gregor's room with cries of excited joy, but she fell silent at the door. Of course, his sister first checked whether everything in the room was in order. Only then did she let his mother walk in. In great haste, 
Gregor had drawn the sheet down even further and wrinkled it more. The whole thing really looked just like a coverlet thrown carelessly over the couch. On this occasion, Gregor held back from spying out from under the sheet. Thus, he remained, he refrained from looking at his mother this time and was just happy that she had come in. Come on, he's not visible, said his sister, and evidently led his mother by the hand. Now Gregor listened as these two weak women shifted the still heavy old chest of drawers from its position. And as his sister constantly took on herself a greater part of the work without listening to the warnings of his mother, who was afraid that she would strain herself, the work lasted a long time. After about a quarter of an hour had already gone by, his mother said it would be better if they left the chest of drawers where it was, because in the first place it was too heavy. They uh, would not be finished before the father's arrival, and leaving the chest of drawers in the middle of the room would block all of Gregor's pathways. But... In the second place, uh, they could not be certain that Gregor uh, would be pleased with the removal of the furniture. To her, the reverse seemed to be true. The sight of the empty walls pierced her right to the heart. And why should Gregor not feel the same, since he had been accustomed to the room furnishings for a long time, and in an empty room, would he feel himself abandoned? Uh, And it is not the case, his mother concluded very quietly, almost whispering as if she wished to prevent Gregor, whose exact location she didn't really know, from uh, hearing even the sound of her voice, for she was convinced that he did not understand her words. And isn't it a fact that by removing the furniture, we're showing that we're giving up all hope of an improvement and leaving him to his own resources without any uh, consideration, I think it would be best if we tried to keep the room exactly in the condition it was before, so that when Gregor returns to us, he finds everything unchanged and he can forget the intervening time all that more easily. Fifteen highlighters think this part's good. As he heard his mother's words, Gregor realized that the lack of all immediate human contact, together with the monotonous life surrounded by the family over the course of these two months, must have confused his understanding, because otherwise he couldn't explain to himself how he, in all seriousness, could have been so keen to have his room emptied. Was he really eager to let the warm room, comfortably furnished with pieces he had inherited, be turned into a cavern, in which he would, of course, then be able to crawl about in all directions without disturbance? But at the time, with a quick and complete forgetting of all human past as well, was he at the, then at this point already on the verge of forgetting, and was it only the voice of his mother, which he had not heard for a long time, that it aroused him? Nothing was to be removed. Everything must remain. In his condition, he could not function without the beneficial influences of his furniture, and if the furniture prevented him from carrying out his senseless crawling all over the place, then there was no harm in that, but rather a great benefit. But his sister, unfortunately, thought otherwise. She had grown accustomed, certainly not without justification, so far as the discussion of matters concerning Gregor was concerned, to act as a special expert with respect to their parents. And so now the mother's advice was for his sister's sufficient reason to insist on the removal, not only of the chest of drawers and the writing desk, which were the only items uh, she had thought about at first, but also of all furniture, with the exception of the indispensable couch, of course. It was not only childish defiance and her recent, very unexpected and hard-won self-confidence, which led her to this demand. She had uh, also actually observed that Gregor needed a great deal of room to creep about. The furniture, on the other hand, as far as one could see, was not of the slightest use. But perhaps the enthusiastic sensibility of young women of her age also played a role. This feeling sought release at every opportunity, and with it, Greet now felt tempted to want to make Gregor's situation even more terrifying, so that uh, then she would be able to do even more for him now. For surely no one except Greet Uh, could ever trust themselves to enter a room in which Gregor ruled the empty walls all by himself. And so she did not let herself be dissuaded from a decision by her mother, who in this room seemed uncertain of herself in her sheer agitation and soon kept quiet, helping his sister with all her energy to 
get the chest of drawers out of the room. Now, Gregor could still do without the chest of drawers if need be, but the writing desk really had to stay, and scarcely had the women left the room with the chest of drawers, groaning as they pushed it, when Gregor stuck his head out from under the sofa to take a look uh, how he could intervene cautiously and with as much consideration as possible. But unfortunately, it was his mother who came back to the room first, while Greet had her arms wrapped around the chest of drawers in the next room and was rocking it back and forth by herself without moving it from its position. His mother was not used to the sight of Gregor. He could have... Uh, made her ill, and so, frightened, Gregor scurried backwards right into the other end of the sofa. But he could no longer prevent the sheet from moving forward a little. That was enough to catch his mother's attention. She came to a halt, stood still for a moment, and then went back to greet. Although Gregor kept repeating to himself over and over that really nothing unusual was going on, that only a few pieces of furniture were being rearranged, and soon had to admit to himself that the Movements of the women to and fro, their quiet conversations, and the scratching of the furniture on the floor affected him, a great swollen commotion on all sides, and so firmly was he pulling in his head and legs and pressing his body onto the floor that he had to tell himself unequivocally that he wouldn't be able to endure all this much longer. They were cleaning out his room, taking away from him everything he cherished. They had already dragged out the chest of drawers, in which the fret saw and other tools were kept they were now loosening the writing desk which was fixed tight to the floor the desk on which he as a business student a school student indeed even as an elementary school student had written out his assignments at that moment he really didn't have any more time to check the good intentions of the two women whose existence he had in any case almost forgotten because in their exhaustion, they were working really silently, and heavily stumbling of their feet was the only sound to be heard. And so he scuttled out. The women were just propping themselves on the writing desk in the next room in order to take a breather, changing the direction of his path four times. He really didn't know what he should rescue first. When he saw hanging conspicuously on the wall, which is otherwise already empty, the picture of the woman dressed in nothing but fur. He quickly scurried up over and pressed himself against the glass which held it in place and which made his hot abdomen feel good. At least this picture, which Gregor at the moment completely concealed, surely no one would now take it away. He twisted his head toward the door of the living room to observe the women as they came back in. They had not allowed themselves very much rest and were coming right back, coming back right away. Greet had placed her arm around her mother and held her tightly. So what shall we take now, said Greet, and looked around her. Then her glance met Gregor's from the wall. She kept her composure only because her mother was there. She bent her face toward her mother in order to prevent her from looking around, and said, although in a trembling voice and too quickly, Come, wouldn't it be better if we went back into the living room uh, just for another moment? Greet's purpose was clear to Gregor. She wanted to bring his mother to a safe place and then chase him down from the wall. Well, let her just try. He squatted on this picture and did not hand it over. He would sooner spring into Greet's face. But Greet's words had immediately made the mother uneasy. She walked to the side, caught sight of the enormous brown splotch on the flowered wallpaper, and before she became truly aware of what she was looking at, it was Gregor, screamed out in a high-pitched, raw voice, Oh, God! Oh, God! and fell with outstretched arms, as if she were surrendering everything. Down onto the couch and lay there motionless. Gregor, you, cried out his sister, with a raised fist and an urgent glare. Since his transformation, these were the first words which she had directed right at him. She ran into the room next door to bring some spirits, or other with which she could revive her mother from her fainting spell. Gregor wanted to help as well. There was time enough to save the picture, but he was stuck fast on the glass and had to tear himself loose forcefully. Then he also scurried into the next room, as if he could give his sister some advice. In earlier times, but then he had to stand there idly behind her. 
while she rummaged about among various small bottles. Still, she was frightened when she turned around. A bottle fell onto the floor and shattered. A splinter of glass wounded Gregor in the face. Some corrosive medicine or other dripped over him. Now, without lingering any longer, Crete took a, as many small bottles as she could hold and ran with them to her mother. She slammed the door shut with her foot. Gregor was now shut off from his mother, who, perhaps near death, thanks to him. He could not open the door, and he did not want to chase away his sister, who had to remain with her mother. At this point, he had nothing to do but wait, and overwhelmed with self-reproach and worry, he began to creep and crawl over everything, walls, furniture, and ceiling. Finally, in his despair, as the entire room started to spin around him, he fell into the middle of a large table. Oh, just spilled coffee all over myself. A short time elapsed. Gregor lay there limply. All around was still. Perhaps that was a good sign. Then there was a ring at the door. The servant girl was naturally shut up in the kitchen, and therefore Greet had to go open the door. The father had arrived. What happened was his first words. Greet's appearance had told him everything. Greet replied with a dull voice. Evidently, she was pressing her face into her father's chest. Mother fainted, eh, but she's getting, getting better now. Gregor has broken loose. Yes, I expected that, said his father. I always told you that, but you women don't want to listen. <laughs> it was clear to Gregor that his father had badly misunderstood Greet's short message and was uh, assuming that Gregor had committed some violent crime or another. Thus... Gregor now had to find his father to calm him down, for he had neither the time nor the ability to explain things to him, so he rushed away to the door of his room and pushed himself against it so that his father could see right away as he entered the hall that Gregor fully intended to return to, at once to his room, that it was not necessarily to drive him back, but that he only needed uh, to open the door and that he would disappear immediately. But his father was not in the mood to observe such niceties. Ah, he yelled as soon as he entered, with a tone as if uh, he were all at once angry and pleased. Gregor pulled back his head from the door and raised it in the direction of his father. He had not really pictured his father as he now stood there. Of course, <clears throat> what with his new style of creeping around, he had in the past, while neglecting to pay attention to what was going on in the rest of the apartment, as he had done before, and really should have grasped the fact that uh, he would encounter different conditions. Nevertheless, nevertheless, was that still his father? Was that the same man who had lain exhausted and buried in bed in earlier days when Gregor was setting out on a business trip, who had received him on the evenings of his return in a sleeping gown and an armchair, totally incapable of standing up, who had only lifted his arm as a sign of happiness, and who, in their rare strolls together a few Sundays a year, and on the important holidays, made his way slowly forward between Gregor and his mother, who themselves moved slowly, always a bit more slowly than him, bundled up in his old coat, all the time setting down his walking stick carefully, and who, when he had wanted to say something, almost always stood still and gathered his entourage around him. <clears throat> but now he was standing up really straight, dressed in a tight-fitting blue uniform with uh, gold buttons, like the ones servants wear at a banking company. Above the high, stiff collar of his jacket, his firm, double chin stuck out prominently beneath his bushy eyebrows. The glance of his black eyes was freshly penetrating and alert. His otherwise disheveled white hair was combed down into a carefully... Uh, exact shining part. He threw his cap, on which a gold monogram, apparently the symbol of the bank, was affixed, in an arc across the entire room onto the sofa and moved, throwing back the edge of the long coat of his uniform with his hands in his trouser pockets and a grim face, right up to Gregor. He really didn't know what he had in mind, but he raised his foot uncommonly high anyway, 
and Gregor was astonished at the gigantic size of the sole of his boot. However, he did not linger on that point, for he knew from the first day of his new life that as far as he was concerned, his father considered the greatest force of the only appropriate response. And so he scurried away from his father, stopped when his father remained standing, and scampered forward again when his father merely stirred. And this way they made their way around the room repeatedly without anything decisive taking place. In fact, because of the slow pace, it didn't look like a chase. Gregor remained on the floor for the time being, especially since he was afraid that his father could <clears throat> take a flight up to the wall or the ceiling in an act of real malice. At any event, Gregor had to tell himself that he couldn't keep up this running around uh, for a long time. Because whenever his father took a single step, uh, he had to go through an enormous number of movements. Already, he was starting to suffer from a shortage of breath. Just as in earlier days, when his lungs had been quite unreliable, as he now staggered around in his way, ordered to gather all his energies for running, hardly keeping his eyes open and feeling so listless that he had no notion at all of any escape other than by running and had almost already forgotten that the walls were available to him. Although they were obstructed by carefully carved furniture full of sharp points and spikes, at that moment, something or other, thrown casually, flew down close by and rolled in front of him. It was an apple. Immediately, a second one flew after it. Gregor stood still in fright. Further, running away was useless, for his father had decided to bombard him. From the fruit bowl on the sideboard, his father had filled his pockets. And now, without the moment taking accurate aim, he was throwing apple after apple. These small, red apples rolled around on the floor as if electrified and collided with each other. A weakly thrown apple grazed Gregor's back but skidded off harmlessly. However, another thrown immediately after. That one drove into Gregor's back really hard. Gregor wanted to drag himself off as if unexpected and incredible pain could go away if he changed his position, but he felt as if he was nailed in place and lay stretched out, completely confused in all his senses. Only with his final glance did he notice how the door of the room was pulled open and how, right in front of his sister, who was yelling, his mother ran out in her undergarments, for his sister had undressed her in order to give her some freedom to breathe. Oh, that's weird weird conclusion to come to <clears throat> in her fainting spell and now her mother then ran up to her father on the way uh, her tied up skirts slipped toward the door one after another and how tripping over her skirts she hurled herself onto his father and throwing her arms around him in complete union with him but at this moment Gregor's powers of sight gave way as her hands reached to the back of his father's head and she begged him to spare Gregor's life. And there you go. Uh, chapter 2 of The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. What did we learn today? We learned that uh, your sister can be helpful, but still find you completely disgusting. Uh, no matter how well-intentioned you are and how you understand that you're gross, you're going to snap like a twig when the picture of the hot woman on your wall is uh, in jeopardy of being taken away. Uh, interesting that uh, pressing his bug belly on the picture of the hot woman uh, felt really, really good to him. So that was a little interesting uh, take there. And then eventually, like an idiot, he scurried out of the room after his sister, which threw everything into turmoil. And the dad got a job as a bank person with big, big boots. So, he's been hit in the back with an apple from an angry dad. And, uh, kind of makes me wish throughout this whole story that if he was going to change into a bug, too bad he didn't get real, real small. That would have probably made him a little bit more adorable and not so creepy. But, that's not the point that Kafka was going for. So tune in for the final chapter in the next, uh, I don't know, a couple days. Thanks for listening. <laughs>